going to reset my timer. <laughs> awesome. So this is kind of going to continue. As I said, I'm going to uh, discuss the first one in this list, metaphors. Um, so this is a work, again, by uh, Jan Fleur and myself um, about modeling adaptive, cooperative, and competitive metaphors as mental models for joint decision making. So we're combining a whole bunch of uh, concepts here. Um, all right, uh, so our contents. So first I'll give a little bit of background so we can get into the more technical parts afterwards. Um, so I'll be discussing cognitive metaphors as mental models, different cognitive metaphors, so competitive or cooperative, um, internal simulation and ownership. Um, and then I'll get more into the model part so the base network so that's like the lowest level of the three level architecture and then using adaptivity and control um so that will be maybe maybe answering a little bit the question of uh, the last person previously and um then i'll like go into the model formalization a little bit more that and again the adaptivity and i'll uh, hopefully have time to show a little bit of the simulation of an example scenario. Okay, so cognitive metaphors. Um, this is a concept I was pretty interested in and then it happened to match really well to uh, mental models. So cognitive metaphors are conceptual structures that are embedded in our um, cognitive system, our brain. <laughs> so for example, um, it's basically mapping. Um, if you like, see something new, you need to kind of uh, understand the new concept based on whatever you already know. So that's how we are making all these structure in our brain um, that are connected to existing concepts and new concepts. So um, for example, we have source domains, which is something you already know, and target domains, which could be something new or whatever. So for example, if you're having an argument and you're using your um, cognitive metaphor of war on this, you can see here the mappings that are resulting. So from the source domain to the target domain. So um, for example, if you're raising an objection and you're using the language either in your head or verbally that you're attacking someone if, or you're maintaining someone's opinion, you're defending um, and things like that. So in your head, you're kind of using a concept of war on your argument, which you can, argue for that this can have uh, some difficult endings in your argument. Well, if you're using, for example, a more um, another kind of more cooperative metaphor, such as dancing in your argument, you can say things like it takes two to tango, stuff like that. You can maybe get to a more cooperative ending of your argument. And this we can all kind of map into the concept of mental models. So uh, cognitive meta metaphors can be a mental model that modulates our mental decision-making process, is strengthened or weakened by learning, and that has control exerted over it. So um, now moving on from the cognitive metaphors to joint decision-making, um, there's a few concepts that are needed for a joint uh, decision. So first of all, internal simulation, which is used as a means for prediction of the expected effects of a preferred action. So we have kind of discussed this in the previous presentation. Um, when you're making a decision, you kind of in your head need to like see what the endings of both possible possibilities of the decision is. Inter internal simulation is triggered by mirror neurons, not a really interesting concept, um, which are neurons that kind of um, make possible actions in our body happen even though they're not actually happen. So they're kind of happening in your brain and it also is for a person, another person. Um, and this is one basis for emphatic understanding of another person. So you can kind of mirror in your own brain what another person is thinking or doing without actually doing it yourself. And then we have ownership, um, which is kind of taking ownership of your own action. And that is another basis for emphatic understanding. So a joint decision fulfills three parts. Um, both persons chose the same option. 
both persons feel good about it and both persons have emphatic understanding of how the other feels about it. And this emphatic understanding is kind of built upon ownership and internal simulation. Um, I'm now moving on to our base network um, of cognitive metaphors as mental models in joint decision-making. So mental models we discussed in the previous presentation a bit and um, metaphors and joint decision-making I discussed now. So we're now combining these three concepts in this model here. So this is the base level, the lowest level of the three level architecture. Um, so I'll just, I'll just highlight a few concepts. So um, the little box is kind of what happens internally. Then on the left, we have our world states, um, which is WS. SS is the sensor states, which is kind of the bridge between outside and inside our brain. Then we have SRS states, which is sensory representations. And then here we have a few other things. Um, first of all, we have a metaphor state. Um, this is a bit simplified because the metaphor state can be both, it can be many different ones. Um, so it can here be cooperative and competitive. Um, and then here we have the ownership state. So if you remember about the action ownership, which is part of emphatic understanding, uh, we have a few different ones because you can have ownership over an emotion and an action um, that you're having yourself. And also these ownership states represent your ownership over your own actions and emotions and over the other person's actions and emotions. Again, to keep the picture uh, viewable, we put it into one photo. And then preparation states is when you're preparing for an action um, or an emotion, which is the BO and AC is the action. Um, and then we have all the way on the right execution <coughs> states or execution of communication, so E, S, and E, C. So you can have an emotion with an action you're doing and you're actually doing the action. So um, I'll just go over um, the internal simulation. So when this one is only representing agent A, so he is getting a um, context stimulus from the world, which is this um, WSS. And following my arrow, that is kind of going for all these states. And then it's coming to the sensory representation state. Um, and then that way he is going to like having an ownership over that sensory representation state. And you can kind of see the arrows that are going left, oh, are going left. And that is kind of all these um, internal Simulation. So here we have a prediction loop, um, which is the preparation state for a certain action going to the sensory representation state of EA, the effect of the action that A can be doing. So it's kind of a prediction. And that prediction then influences the ownership of agent A on his actions or emotions. Um, and we also have an, a body loop as if body loop, which is internal simulation. So having the preparation states for the feeling of A going to the sensory representation state of that feeling. And again, that is actually um, influencing the preparation state of the action as well. So this might go a little bit fast. I'm just gonna continue now so I can get through, but feel free to uh, ask me about it afterwards. Um, then between A and B, you can see that um, the outputs of agent uh, B for the emotion and the action actually go into the model of person A, uh, the world states for, a, for agent B that go into agent A. So that's how in the model we're actually working with two agents. Now, how does the cognitive metaphor come into place here? Um, so the roles of the metaphor state is how it is affected by certain states uh, via the incoming arrows and the pathways to the metaphor state and how also it affects other states and processes through the outgoing arrows and pathways from the metaphor state. Um, so that is here modeled by um, a connection from the context, re context representation states. So 
the SRSSA, I already discussed it previously, to the metaphor states, um, as you can see in the picture below. So it's going to uh, the cooperative and the competitive metaphor. So in the previous picture, you saw only one state for the metaphor. And because there was no space, but it's actually looking like the picture below. And metaphor state uh, of person A influences the own self-ownership state uh, for both the action and the emotion, for, for the action and the feelings. So this way, through the ownership states, the metaphor states can influence on whether a person goes for the action or not. So it's kind of uh, modulating these ownership states. Um, and between each metaphor state, there is a negative mutual uh, connection so that only one of the, the metaphor states can win kind of in the model because you can't really have two metaphors in our modeling, at least. Um, I'm gonna talk about the adaptivity of these metaphors soon, but I'll first quickly um, talk about, I think this maybe relates to the question of uh, about the previous paper about dynamic processes. So again, on the bottom part, we have the level, uh, the level base that we just looked at. Then in the first, um, the first order self-modeling level, we have the first level of adaptation. So if you look well, the way you can understand it is that the connections between the states that you want to be adapted would turn into a state themselves. Um, so this is called reification as well. So for example, um, we have a adaptive relation between the context, the SRSS, and the, me the competitive metaphor over here, this black line. So there is a state here, which is the first order self-modeling state between SRSS and the competitive metaphor, as you see in the name. And it has um, relationships from each state. So that way, the relationship is kind of objectified and influenced by each state. And then it has a downward connecting arrow to the state that is that is the kind of on the receiving end of the connection. Um, so that's how we kind of made this cognitive architecture that uh, allows productivity over time. So when uh, the states that influence this relationship are changed, then the adaptivity is also uh, changed. Um, and then we also have a second order level, which then you can kind of go on with 50 levels, but that becomes a bit complicated. But this um, um, HW metaphor is kind of an overall controlling state. Um, this is a control level of how fast all of these are adapting. So this is a speed state. So this way you can kind of have the base level on the middle first order level, you have all the adaptions and on the top level you control here the speed of those adaptions. For the um, metaphors, the way that adaptivity works. So for a cooperative approach, we make sure that the self-ownership is strengthened if the other person tends to go for the action and is weakened if the other person tends to not go for it. And it's the opposite for the competitive approach. I'm gonna go a little faster because they wanna get to the simulation part. Um, so basically every time the cooperative and the competitive are kind of just the other way around. So the adaptive effects are modeled as follows. The cooperative metaphor state for a uh, metaphor cooperative by agent A increases the self-ownership states uh, for the actions for the feelings, the OSs. Um, if the other person B tends to go for the action or, or the feeling, and decreases the ownership state if B tends to not go for the feeling uh, for the action. So it's kind of going along with what B does. And the competitive metaphor again does the opposite. So how we model this. Um, so I'm using as an example the cooperative metaphor. So for the cooperative case of the, the W states, which again, that is the middle level, the big W's. Um, so this, these are these connections between the cooperative metaphors to the ownership of the action of agent A. Um, so the linear scale mapping that we're using um, to the interview uh, interval minus one to um, one 
it's monotonically increasing. So as follows, activation values of smaller than half for agent B doing a specific action. So uh, for not doing um, a specific action, sorry, so because it's smaller than a half, means that B doesn't want to do the action, are mapped onto negative activation values for um, these W states. And on the other hand, if the activation values are bigger than a half for agent B doing action A, AC, um, these are mapped onto positive activation values. So you will see in the simulation soon um, that I'll just quickly show that these W states can be positive and negative at the same time. Okay, so these are these uh, graphs that you've also seen in a few of the previous presentations. Um, so just quickly going over it, um, the thin lines are showing that B um, wanted to do action A from the beginning because they're going activated. And over here, the thick lines are agent A. So you can see that for until about 160, A did not want to do the action and B did, but we gave A a cooperative metaphor. So in the end, uh, after about 160, you see that A is actually activated their actions, action A. So um, A and B are both doing it. And this, this brown line is actually uh, the emphatic response of A to B's tendency for AC. So that's also getting activated. And this is like the first round. In the second round, you see that these emphatic responses um, are higher for A. And B is also showing an emphatic response for A's tendency of doing AC in the second round. So you can see that learning actually takes place. And this is the same scenario, but we kind of split up the states to see things better. Um, so this is kind of more the metaphor and the adaptive part. Um, so I'm again highlighting a few interesting parts. So um, the big green line is the adaptation control states for both of them. So we're like kind of turning them on and off. Um, and that means that the speed is going up and down. And then the thick uh, red line is the metaphor activation states for the cooperative metaphor for A and the competitive uh, metaphor for B, because that's what we gave them by uh, putting the parameters in a specific way. Um, and then interestingly, as I said, the light blue thicker line is the adaptive weight of the connection. So that um, is those, oh, I'm just quickly going to show for understanding it. The, th the thicker light blue line is, the, is these kind of states. So as I said, they were mapped from minus one to one. And you can see kind of um, how they're like adapting over time because the way that the decisions are being made. Um, because for example, at some point A decides to do action AC because it's a cooperative person and B is doing that action even though A didn't really want it from the beginning. So um, that kind of flips around the adaptivity of the metaphor. Um, so that's maybe answering the question from before how like over time with changing scenarios, the model can be adapted. Um, okay, I think, yeah, just a quick summary. So we uh, built upon this um, cognitive architecture of a self-modeling network to model joint decision-making with cognitive metaphors. Um, and these cognitive metaphors were considered as mental models. And we have used internal simulation and ownership. Um, and the model incorporated plasticity and metaplasticity, would mean, which means learning and control over learning. I think I just, made it in time. So if there's any questions, uh, please go ahead. I would like to ask a question. Sure. Um, you describe uh, all scenarios that you know a priori. Can you imagine a system built on these principles that would encounter a new situation which was not anticipated and be able mm -hmm. to build the model and process according to it? Mm. I like that. Um, I can imagine it's possible because 
of the adaptivity of the system. I've not tried it yet, but maybe uh, maybe Jan has tried that before, but I haven't yet. <laughs> okay, but thanks. I like the idea. Please, Sam, go ahead. Uh, similar on a similar line, Alexi. Uh, so one, you like for instance, you have this this metaphor that you handed the system. Uh, for one, I think it's I think it's an excellent approach to look at a, a, a complex dynamical system with lots of feedback loops to, to represent these things. I think that's a very a very um, fruitful approach. The interesting question is is okay, how do you get to these things? Can the system generate them themselves based on experience or or learning from others? Where does the metaphor come from? Does it generate its own? Uh, I think that's a little about what Alexi was talking about. When you're faced with a new situation, uh, you know, what does this system do? But uh, open question. Yeah, I think that um, the action already is a bit dynamic. We didn't like choose a specific action, but I really like the idea of like uh, doing like more unknown metaphors and making it more dynamic. So thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? We are behind the schedule. Yeah, so the next talk is by Tim and Beamster. Uh, am I right? Yeah.